trip of a lifetime. Okay, we're ready to start. So welcome back from spring break. Um, I was saying I'm not feeling that well, so I may be going a little slow today, so maybe that'll match your mood as well. Uh, we're going to start, I'll try to catch you up to where we've been, and uh, today we probably won't finish, but we're going to try to finish talking about um, experimental data because we want to get on to the generalized Newtonian fluid. We're one lecture behind because of the snowstorm, but um, we'll figure out how that works out. So we've been producing this summary sheet of experimental behavior that we're, this is the sheet that I'm asking you to learn um, these qualitative pieces of behavior because we're going to use them to discriminate between constitutive equations. So what we did previously, and now probably seems a long time ago, was we talked about steady shear material properties. And first, how it changed with the kinematic parameters, which, were, which was the shear rate. But then how steady shear properties changed with molecular weight. Uh, we saw how viscosity and first normal stress difference changed. And we noted that the zero shear viscosity versus molecular weight forms this very particular shape although the high shear rate viscosity is unaffected by molecular weight. We also pointed out the effect of molecular weight distribution, which is to broaden the distribution between the plateau and the steady shear behavior. And then we talked about the effects that different changes in material structure can bring about. Uh, for branch materials, it's quite complex, but it's mostly related to the ability to disentangle. When you have really long side branches, you're, um, you have this entangling between the different chains, and they're very difficult to disentangle. Once they disentangle, there's less of an effect. We also talked about um, filled polymers. Filled polymers uh, change the... Uh, level of the zero shear viscosity and make it turn upward a bit. I don't know that my graph shows it that well, but it makes it turn upward a bit uh, towards having a slope of minus one here at, the, at low shear rates. So that was um, steady shear. Then we moved on to unsteady shear here on the slides. So we did start talking about this already. And we're going to talk about small amplitude oscillatory shear, uh, which is a very widely used measurement, and um, some large strain data. And the last thing we'll talk about will be some elongational data, but there's really not that much of that. Now on, on small amplitude oscillatory shear, I have started, as I said, um, lecturing on this before, so I'll just be a little brief here. This is a classic curve for a um, long linear polymer. And it's actually a composite curve uh, that's been constructed by the time temperature superposition principle, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But the basic features are that at very high frequencies, let's just look at G prime. G prime comes to a plateau. And this plateau level is always something like you know, 10 to the 9th. Pascal. It, at intermediate frequencies, it drops by many orders of magnitude, reaching what's called the rubbery plateau, which is something like 10 to the 6th Pascals, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, depending on the polymer. And that's a characteristic quantity of different polymers. And then it dives down into this zone, which is called the terminal regime, which is very characteristic as well. In the, in the terminal zone, uh, G prime reaches a slope of 2, and that slope carries on for all lower frequencies. Now, G double prime has a, a different shape. The G prime, remember, is the storage modulus, and G double prime is the loss modulus. The loss modulus goes through a maximum about where G prime uh, starts to drop. It also goes through a maximum here where G prime starts to drop. So that's um, a related function. It has a minimum in the middle of the rubbery plateau, and at very low frequency, it goes to a slope of 1. So 
as I pointed out last time, these three regimes are known, have very characteristic names. They're known as the glassy zone, the rubbery zone, and the terminal zone. And although this is a plot of modulus versus frequency, it's, um, it's at least I, in an uh, idea, in an in a anal analogous way, it's kind of related to temperature. Up here, when you, when you deform a sample at very high frequencies, it's as if you're, it's as if it's frozen because you're, you're deforming it so rapidly that it has no ability to respond. And that's how a glass behaves. And this is, in fact, um, the modulus you would measure at very, very low temperatures on a material when it becomes a glass. So that's why this is called the glassy zone. In the rubbery zone, that's the zone in which your, your frequency is lower now and your material is able to respond. But in the rubbery zone, so we imagine we have these, these entangled polymers. In the rubbery zone, it's the entanglements, okay, the, the parts of the molecules that are sort of linking up with one another that dominate the relaxation behavior. And so it behaves very much like a cross-linked rubber. So a cross-linked rubber would be a bunch of polymer chains that have a chemical bond uh, linking them together. And when you put such a, a material into a shear flow, um, it just behaves like a solid, a rubbery solid. And the rubbery solids have a constant modulus. So there's a zone, there's a particular range of frequencies in which an, an entangled network also has a constant modulus, and that's this plateau right here. So that is an analogous behavior to a cross-linked rubber. So that explains why this is called the rubbery zone. Now in temperature, when you go from a glassy behavior to a more liquid rubbery and then a liquid behavior, that would be the glass transition temperature, and so this this drop here is often identified as the glass transition temperature type of, of loosening up, only it's happening in frequency instead of happening in temperature. So as you probe the material with lower and lower frequencies, as, it's as if you're probing the material at higher and higher temperatures. The terminal zone is when the whole polymer loosens up and acts like a liquid. And uh, we're going to see that our constitutive equations can predict this zone perfectly. These slopes of 2 and 1 down here are perfectly explicable through linear viscoelastic theory. So let's summarize that for our sheet here. So this would be my page five. And we've done one steady shear, two steady shear on branched. Let's do, let's see, one, A, B, C, okay, two, okay, three steady shear on filled, four small amplitude oscillatory shear on linear polymers. And what I'd like you to remember is uh, the general shape, which is high, down to another plateau, and then down to a slope of 2 for G prime. And then a slope of 1, I'm going the other way now, a minimum like this, G double prime. The main features I want you to remember are these slopes at low frequency. G prime goes like omega squared. G double prime goes like omega. At intermediate frequency, G prime has a plateau. And at high frequencies, uh, G prime plateaus again, but it's more at like 10 to the ninth. <coughs> now, 
Now, a lot of this information on um, small oscillatory shear has been expanded on in the literature. And the handout I gave you today is a map of small amplitude oscillatory shear behavior that appears in John Ferry's book. And I have them here on my transparencies as well. And here's the reference on the bottom. And it's also on your handout. This book, Viscoelastic Properties of Polymers, explains all kinds of behavior for all kinds of variations in material properties. So branching, molecular weight, um, chemical composition, becoming a block copolymer, mixing it with other materials. All those varieties are explained and described in Ferry. So this is a very good reference. And it allows these kind of small amplitude measurements to be used kind of like spectroscopy in a chem class. So in a chem class, when you put something in an NMR or in an FTIR, you get a scan. And then you learn what the characteristic peaks are for different chemical properties. And then you can take an unknown, put that sample in the instrument, and back out some information about the chemical structure. And we can do that in small amplitude oscillatory shear with the help of, of books like uh, John Ferry's book. So this is um, a blow up of John Ferry's graph that explains the various the variations in G prime behavior that you get when you change to different types of materials. So for instance, on the next page, which is the first page of your handout, there's the identification of all these keys um, uh, for polymers 1 through 7, or 8, actually. And he shows the differences that happen in these G prime and G double prime plots when you have, say, polymer solutions, low molecular weight versus high molecular weight, long side groups, uh, samples below their TG, um, when they're likely cross-linked, et cetera. So if I go back to this plot, the only one I've shown you here is number three. Okay, There's number three that we've just seen on our previous discussion. But you can see there's all these other behaviors. So for a dilute polymer solution, it looks like this. It's a, a very much lower G. And it doesn't, uh, it's impossible to get to a high enough frequency that you'll see glassy behavior. It does not exhibit this rubbery behavior. And it does exhibit this flow behavior. Um, if we look at uh, number three is the one we've already looked at. If we add long side groups, we get to the four behavior. So this is the four behavior. So just by looking at this, we can compare. When it has long side groups, it depresses the modulus in the glassy regime. It increases uh, the glass transition temperature. So the frequency at which we see this uh, glass transition effect becomes a higher frequency. The presence of long side groups doesn't affect the existence of a plateau, except that it lowers it. And then eventually, it, it comes to a, a flow regime, a terminal zone of some sort at very, very low frequencies. This, this part of the graph is for the materials that are glassier. So for instance, number six. Number six is a lightly cross-linked material. So this is a material that is, in fact, a cross-linked rubber. But there is a long, long distance between cross-links. And when that's the case, you have a constant modulus <coughs> until you probe it at really, really high frequencies when you will see that same glassy behavior that you see in a linear polymer. So this is a lightly cross-linked material. And this is a uncross-linked material. And the difference happens right here, where this, this rubbery plateau ends and turns over into a flowing material. So this, this kind of spectroscopy is, uh, is really what this um, type of measurement is most often used for. And you can do this kind of mapping in more material functions than just G prime. You can do it in uh, G double prime. So here's, again, our friend number three, a long amorphous polymer, a maximum near the glass transition, a maximum near the rubbery plateau, and a slope of one. But then there's all this other behavior that we can look at closely and, and compare and learn how the G pri double prime ma uh, material function behaves. And then there are all kinds of other material functions. For instance, 
uh, the step strain material function. This is the one we discussed where you would do a, put a sample in a shear apparatus and just do one quick step. And again, we have this mapping that we can learn. Here's tan delta, uh, which is the ratio of G double prime to G prime. So I gave you those handouts so that you would have those for your reference as well. Okay, so going back to my summary sheet, uh, what I'd like you to know is this general shape and the identity of these three zones, terminal, rubbery, and glassy. And this is for uh, linear polymers, high molecular weight. And I've just put a note there to see John Ferry's book for more information on that. Now, one material function I didn't mention yet, but there is a plot in Ferry for this one as well, is A to prime or A to star. These are also calculated from the small amplitude oscillatory shear experiment. Uh, and one of the most common uses of this material function is this so-called Cox-Mertz rule. And the Cox-Mertz rule, as stated on this slide, is an empirical way to infer, which means guess, okay, to infer steady shear data from small amplitude oscillatory shear. Now, steady shear data is not that hard to take, but it is harder to take than small amplitude oscillatory shear. And on a lot of materials, uh, speed is of the essence in industrial practice. And so the in practitioners will take an eta star curve versus frequency instead of a, a steady shear result. And what Cox and Mertz determined was that for many materials, eta star, for no reason that anybody has ever been able to prove, uh, is nearly identical to um, eta, the steady shear viscosity. There are some arguments that it should be very near A to prime because A to prime is the loss behavior of the material. It's like G double prime. But in fact, it's A to star that, as you can see from this graph, uh, maps. So the rule is written here mathematically, let's say, that if you plot viscosity versus shear rate on the same axes as uh, complex viscosity, A to star, versus frequency, where you equate frequency and shear rate, okay, so that you put them at the same value of x, you should get the same plot. So that's an interesting empiricism that is very widely used. I'm not going to put it on our sheet of things we have to know necessarily. Now on this um, linear viscoelastic behavior, I pointed out that there was, if I go back over here, that in G prime there's a very high plateau, it comes down, and then there's the rubbery plateau. One other thing I'd like you to notice is that the width of this rubbery plateau uh, we understand, and we understand it because of data like I have on this graph. The width of the rubbery plateau uh, is, ex is directly related to the molecular weight of the material. So here we have some very low molecular weight materials, and they don't show a rubbery plateau. They go right to a slope of uh, 2 and right up and go to their glassy plateau. They never have a rubbery plateau. But as you increase the molecular weight, they start to inflect a little bit. And then you do data on slightly higher molecular weight, you get a small rubbery plateau. And as you increase the molecular weight, the width of this plateau gets wider and wider. And these curves shift off to the left. The right-hand side, okay, all, the, all this glassy regime is unchanged. It's actually al always the same for all these different molecular weight materials. So the only effect of molecular weight is to broaden the, uh, the plateau. So I'd like to put that on our list, that the breadth of the rubbery plateau is proportional to molecular weight.
Now, if I go back through my notes here, we talked about molecular weight effects on steady shear viscosity. And there, we said there was a critical molecular weight below which the character of how the material depends on molecular weight changes. And this is also a critical molecular weight in small amplitude oscillatory shear. Below this critical molecular weight, you don't see the rubbery plateau. So that's noted on this slide. When the molecular weight is below M sub C, there is no plateau. So these are below M sub C. And then starting with the one that's labeled L34, you start to see the plateau. And so those are above the critical molecular weight for entanglement. So there's really a lot of data like this out there. We're not going to be able to dwell on this um, or become experts. So it's all out there in case uh, any of this becomes useful to you. This, uh, for completeness, is, this, is the same data uh, as this slide, um, narrow molecular weight distribution polystyrene. This was G prime. If we look at G double prime, the slopes are 1. Okay, Look how nicely they all follow that slope of 1. And they all have some kind of a minimum or a double minimum uh, along where that plateau in G prime was. And there's also um, a change at, at M sub C. Uh, the information that we have on the glass transition temperature uh, portion of the curve comes from data on things like block copolymers. I don't want to spend a long time on this because I just don't have that much time. But these are data of um, G prime as a function of temperature. Right? Now let me uh, flash back to those fairy plots that you have in front of you. When we looked at G prime as a function of frequency, this curve, remember that shape. Flash forward to G prime as a function of temperature. Look at that shape. It's the same, except mirror image. Right? Do you agree with me? So it's got the high molecular weight, this glassy plateau, some region where there's a glass transition temperature, there's a rubbery plateau, and then there's a dropping off. It's not quite the same shape, but it's very close. And so measurements of G prime versus uh, temperature, this is temperature, uh, can tell us about how, have told us the things I've passed on to you about the movement of this regime. And you can see that in some data here. Here are data of random copolymers. So these are materials that are mixtures of uh, isoprene and styrene. And when it's pure isoprene, it has a glass transition temperature of about minus 75. And when it's pure polystyrene, it has a glass transition temperature of something like 100. And when you mix the two by making a random copolymer, that Tg uh, shifts along in temperature. I don't, again, there's more on this in the book. I don't need to. Um, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Block copolymers are different. Uh, they don't have this intimate mixing of random copolymers. And so they tend to show both a Tg of the polyisoprene. So like this curve shows both a little bit of a Tg of polyisoprene and then a further later Tg of the polystyrene. And this has been very widely used in interpreting the structure of block copolymers. So again, there's a lot more of that in my book, and there's a lot more of that in the literature. Uh, but we're only taking a taste of it now so that we can look at constitutive modeling. And so we've had a little taste of small amplitude oscillatory shear on linear polymers. Um, in this particular set of slides, um, which is lecture number 22, I believe, there's going to be also a lot of detail I'm going to skip over. Uh, because we just don't have the time to go that closely into it. But I'm going to point out a few things, uh, the time temperature superposition effect, and maybe a few other things, and then move on to the large strain um, data. Okay. So the effect with temperature 
is a very, very interesting one because um, this is actually a technique that's very widely used in reporting data. Uh, here are data. This is small amplitude oscillatory shear data. It happens to be um, the creep compliance modulus, J prime, as a function of frequency. So you would sit down at the instrument and take one of these data sets, let's say these pink, uh, these pink circles. That would be one data run that you would take as a function of frequency at a given temperature. In this case, I'm picking the one at 54.4 degrees. If you did it at a higher temperature, compliance is 1 over modulus. So if you did it at a higher temperature, it would comply more. It would strain more, so it would, it would increase. If you did it at lower temperature, the response would, would decrease. And in fact, the shape of the curve changes. Now, I don't know whether it strikes you, but there is some logic to how all of these curves are changing with temperature. It looks like if I slid the top curves off to the left, they would match up. If I, if I slid the bottom curves off to the right, they would match up. And we could make one composite curve. And that is, in fact, the case. And now I'm going to skip ahead here. That is called time temperature superposition. So let me show you that that works. Okay? This is the same exact data with all of the curves shifted until they matched up. And they match up very, very well. Okay. So this is something that was discovered by a rheologist just empirically, just like the Cox-Mertz rule. And it, it's used very, very widely. So what people do is they'll take a measurement at one temperature, and then they'll infer the values at other temperatures based on time temperature superposition. And this is also an explanation, really, of how we ever got such a wide range of frequency on the curves that are in front of you in that fairy plot. That wide range of frequency is not actually measurable. Those are a result of time temperature superposition. So what exactly is this? How does this ma magic occur? So let me go back and, and highlight a few of the things in, in my notes here. Um, it happens because these moduli are fundamentally a function of frequency and relaxation time and relaxation modulus. Now, these are fundamental parameters that we're going to be discussing when we talk about um, the linear viscoelastic constitutive equation. The short version of all this is that the way that these parameters vary with temperature is very structured. And because of that very organized way in which these parameters vary with temperature, this, these data turn out to be very structured and we're able to shift them horizontally to get a beautiful match of the data. So I'm going to, again, there's some discussion in the book that I'm not going to take the time to go through now. But uh, you can show through some simple analysis that if you just plot something that has a scaling, in if, if, this, if this omega function and this lambda function always appear together, then when you plot them, obviously, versus the grouped variable, you get a single curve. But if you plot them versus only one of the variables, you get a parametric set, which looks very much like the data we have. So what we have is a situation where omega and lambda always appear together. These are the details that I'm skipping. But because they always appear together, we can uh, use them in this way and plot a, what's called a reduced variable plot, which is called the time temperature superposition plot. So I know this, I'm going through this too fast for you to really get it. I'm presenting it to you uh, just to pique your interest, perhaps. And maybe if you um, do end up working in this area, you'll hear about it. You'll definitely hear about it if you end up working in this area. Uh, and there's a very long discussion in the book uh, that you can use to learn more about it. The bottom line is you take your data, you multiply it by an absolute reference temperature, an absolute reference density, and divide it by each individual temperature. So this is the data at every temperature multiplied by this constant. These are two are constant because they're reference values. Divided by the temperature, and you get um, a universal function. Okay? a function of 
some shifted frequency and the correct um, relaxation time. Then you do a manual shift to calculate this uh, frequency, this uh, shifting. So the shifting factor is what we, we shifted horizontally. And the only vertical shift we had to make was this ratio of temperatures right here. The rules of uh, superposition are a little bit different for the viscosity functions, but things do shift well for viscosity as well. Here are the original data I showed you for steady shear viscosity versus shear rate. I've shown these data before on a polybutadiene. And these data will collapse to a single curve. They all have the same shape uh, following this same kind of procedure. So the, the shift parameter is right here. It's this AT. You have to know it in order to back out from this, uh, what's called a master curve. To back out from this master curve, individual values of viscosity, you need to know AT is a function of temperature. So for instance, if I have this master curve, and if I have AT as a function of temperature, I can, I can uh, pick a value of temperature, get AT, and then off of this graph, I can pick off of this, uh, uh, let's say I'm interested in a particular shear rate at a particular temperature. I get AT from that graph. I know AT. I know the shear rate I want. I multiply them. That gives me AT gamma dot. Then I read up here, and I know the viscosity. So this is a very compact way of representing uh, viscosity data over a very wide temperature range. This um, similarity that I uh, have briefly introduced here is also the reason why those G prime versus frequency curves look so much like G prime versus temperature curves. There's a discussion of that in the book for people more interested in that. So let me just summarize from that. I know that was uh, very vague. Um, I just want to make a note uh, that temperature has a strong effect on small amplitude oscillatory shear and other uh, rheological functions. All right, so that was a brief tour through small amplitude oscillatory shear and some G, G of T data, which is step strain data. And now let's talk about large strain. Uh, some of this data you've seen before. Okay, this first slide, for instance, will be familiar to you because as I've talked about the startup experiment, I've shown these data before. Uh, this is Menzies and Gressley's polybutadiene data. Uh, this is the startup function. And we've seen before that there's a overshoot in the startup function until the data come to a steady plateau value. We're going to see a constitutive equation that's able to predict these different plateaus. And in fact, you saw a little bit in the homework about that. Uh, but we're going to have to work harder to get something that will predict these overshoots. The first normal stress coefficient also is, uh, has an overshoot and also is a function of, of shear rate. Cessation of steady shearing is a function of shear rate. So as you shear, this is our kinematics for cessation of steady shearing. We impose shear flow, we shear it, and then at time t equals 0, we stop. And then the stress relaxes, and we divide stress by the uh, original shear rate, and we get these curves. For first normal stress difference, we get uh, similar curves uh, with a slightly different relaxation behavior. I'm going to skip uh, creep. There's uh, 
some creep data in the book. I, I'll just show you that there's, again, time temperature superposition in creep. This is the raw data. And when they're properly shifted, this is the master curve. It shifts very nicely. And I want to move on instead to strain dependence. So let me summarize here. Number five, uh, nonlinear rheological behavior. And for nonlinear behavior, we had startup and cessation. And what we saw is that typically, if I wanted you to just sketch for me eta plus as a function of time, typically it is uh, an overshoot. Okay? There's an overshoot. and a um, shear rate dependence. And for cessation, there's a shear rate dependence. I'm not quite ready to summarize it next, but our next point will be, again, under nonlinear rheological behavior, it will be large amplitude. Step strain. So let me talk a little bit about large amplitude step, step strain here. These are data on polystyrene solution of the step strain experiment. So we've seen the step strain experiment. We've seen G of T before. Let me show you how, how we can put our knowledge to work. We have, we have our summary sheet, or you have the sheet of Ferry's data in front of you. And just looking at the blue curve in this data, um, actually, I it's, it's not this one, but it's the one on your sheet. Um, Andy, can I borrow your handout, the handout from today? Oh, maybe you don't have it. Uh, Carl, I'll borrow yours. Take a look at G prime, G double prime. Yeah. Take a look at this one, OK? Here's G of T. And now on this screen, we have some data, just this one here. Okay? The, way, the way you use these maps is you look at this data and you say, well, this is starting at a modulus of about, well, this is 10 to, between 10 to the third and 10 to the fourth. And then you look at a map like Ferry's map and say, well, 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth. Um, these are in slightly different units. These are in dynes per square centimeters, which is one decade higher than Pascal. So this is a, there's a, like a plateau here at about, I don't know, two or three times 10 to the third Pascal, which would be, let's say, three times 10 to the fourth in dynes. So there's some kind of a, it's down here at three times 10 to the fourth. So when we look at how the data should be similar, it should be similar to stuff going on down here, and we're not looking at glassy behavior. We're looking at some kind of behavior that's either unentangled or solution behavior, or we're looking at entangled behavior with a very, very low plateau. Okay? And that's, in fact, what we're looking at. We're looking at a polystyrene solution. And so these are plateaus for a polystyrene melt. 
For polystyrene solution, it has this same shape. There's a plateau and then a dropping off. And, uh, and uh, it just is happening at a lower plateau level because it's a, low, it's a uh, solution. It's a material that's been loosened up by having solvent in it. And so that's exactly what we see here. So this G of T data is telling us what the plateau modulus is. The plateau modulus for this particular solution is this value, whatever that is, maybe 3 times 10 to the third pascals. Okay. This is actually also telling us, we'll learn this later, the longest relaxation time of this material because that's related to how this curve changes shape, how it drops off and eventually goes to zero. Now, what is different about the data I'm showing here than what's on Ferry's data is that Ferry's data is all linear viscoelastic. Okay, this is the title of the book, Viscoelastic Properties of Polymers. These are on the linear regime. These are the linear viscoelastic properties, and I'm showing you what happens when you strain the sample. So this is the, again, this is the uh, experiment where we do a, a quick straining and stop. If we do a very small amplitude, it's the value we get for G of T is independent of amplitude. If we do larger and larger strains, it's no longer independent of amplitude. And so this is what you see. You see curves that, as long as the strain is less than 2, uh, they all align with the blue curve. And as you increase strain, they show a slightly different shape and uh, a strain effect. This uh, strain effect is something that when we get to our advanced constitutive equations, we have to look for, okay? Because this is the observation, and we want our constitutive equations to predict this observation. This observation is usually summarized by using a shifting technique to get a master curve. So this data have been shifted vertically, just uh, empirically shifted vertically until they matched mostly. They don't match at low, uh, at short times, but they match at very long times. So shifting things vertically, and I'll go back up one slide, is like saying, on a log-log graph, is like saying that here's our data. We're saying that uh, there's a time part, and the shape of the time part won't change. It'll just be shifted downward by some amount that depends on how much strain you put on there. Okay, so this function that shifts the G, shifts this curve down. So the change in shape is all this short time stuff. So we're ignoring that, ignore that. Everything here looks like it was just shifted down by some amount. So you can measure how much this needs to be shifted. Shift the pink up, shift the yellow up, shift the turquoise up until they're all on the same graph. And those values are H of gamma. When that works, you get very nice master curves like this, and you get an H of gamma that can be predicted from constitutive equations. So this is a very popular method for measuring nonlinear properties because, it's, again, it's possible to do it in a very simple uh, instrument. Our malvern Bolin instrument will do this experiment. And you can very easily vary the amount of this straining and do this superposition to determine the nonlinear behavior of the sample. So the important thing to take away from large amplitude step strain is that uh, G of T is the linear modulus, and G of T and strain is the nonlinear modulus. And for many materials, uh, G of T gamma is equal to G of T H of gamma. So it looks a little bit like separation of variables in differential equations class. Okay, we have this function of two variables, and we're hypothesizing that it's separable into two functions, that one is only a function of time, and one is only a function of strain. And that's called time strain separability. And it looks like this. It looks like uh, 
take your raw data, this is increasing strain, and convert it into This is strain of T and gamma. Turn it into a single master curve. And the H function. That H function is called the damping function. It has the same shape that we're kind of familiar with from viscosity. And um, there's some logic to that, although it's really quite a different function. But it is up here where it's independent of strain, you're still in the linear regime. And then when it starts to be a function of strain, you're in the nonlinear regime. So to summarize, for steady shear flow, we, we focused on the differences that different materials exhibited. For unsteady shear, we focus only really on linear polymers, because we want to focus instead on the time effects and the strain effects, the nonlinear effects. So in small amplitude oscillatory shear, we saw the classic shape of G, especially G prime as a function of frequency. Uh, this is a very easy test to perform. And we're going to see that we're going to be able to make predictions of these data with uh, the model, one of the models we're going to deal with. These small amplitude oscillatory shear data can't tell us anything about nonlinearities, however. So to talk about nonlinearities, we have to do either a startup, a cessation, or a, a, sta a step strain experiment. So the step strain experiment is the one that is easiest to perform and gives us a way to differentiate constitutive equations. And I only talked about it briefly, uh, but hanging over all of this is the time temperature shifting concept. Uh, which is very important, but it's, not, it, it's very important in rheology. It's not going to be as important to us. Uh, but it is going to raise its head a few times because you'll see that we have data that comes from time temperature superposition. So that was unsteady shear flow. Uh, the, the last topic of, of elongation is unfortunately very, very brief uh, because there are not that many data in elongational flow. So let me show them to you. You've seen this plot before, in fact. Uh, the eta bar viscosity is typically uh, either a very flat viscosity as a function of elongation rate, or it has a slight thickening and then thinning behavior. Thickening and then thinning behavior. But it's not nearly as pronounced. This is shear data. It's not nearly as pronounced as shear data. This is melt data on a polystyrene. This is startup of elongation on a polypropylene. And these data don't even get to steady state. So this is so different from the one we summarized before for shear. In shear, when we had startup, we had overshoot and then coming to plateau values. And in the case of elongation, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't overshoot. It goes up, and then the sample breaks, and we don't know. So we don't know whether the sample is going to overshoot and come to a constant value, or whether it's just going to go up. And we are going to see constitutive equations that predict, in fact, that these curves just go up to infinity. So the data and the models, we can predict various things, but you have to match uh, what the predictions of your model are 
to what your material is actually doing. Here, for example, is a low-density polyethylene that's been fit to a nonlinear constitutive model called the pom-pom model. Uh, it does a good job of fitting it, but you can see that a lot of the character of the prediction actually takes place after the data. Uh, we really don't know that it goes to these constant plateaus. So we'll talk about that when, when we talk about uh, elongational data. So I'll summarize this again on Wednesday, but that's all I really want to talk about with the um, material properties. And we'll see them again as we talk about the constitutive models and see how well or not well they predict the same kind of behavior. Okay? So we'll start that up on, on Wednesday.